Good afternoon and thanks for being here. My name is Moises Naim. I work at the Carnegie Endowment, a think tank in Washington. It's my honor and my privilege to introduce President Peña Nieto from Mexico, with whom we are going to have an open-ended uh, conversation. Um, as um, most of you speak Spanish, I w we are going to have the conversation in Spanish. Uh, you have, of course, the simultaneous translation uh, equipment uh, in your chairs. Presidente, bienvenido. Welcome, President Peña Nieto. It's a pleasure being with you. Thank you. Some of the questions everyone here is asking, what will happen to Chapo in Mexico? And President Peña is going to give us an answer to that, but this will be at the end so that you can stay and wait for his answer at the end. Well, President Latin America, which is the main subject matter of this afternoon in Mexico as well, there are winds of change in the economies, for instance, in Latin America, and winds of change also in politics. Could you tell us a little bit about your vision about these changes that are taking place in Latin America? Yes, it, it's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to be with you today. And this was uh, the, the meeting of heads of state of the Latin American region. Uh, however, let me talk about this region. And how really we are going through so many changes in recent years. Latin America, for instance, has been uh, known uh, for now 20, 30 years for being a convulsed uh, region politically and economically. And uh, uh, however, there is no doubt that this is a region of the world with great changes. This is a re region of the world which practically, uh, which practically 10% of the population lives. And this is also a region in which we can see different variables, variables that are positive for the development of this region. The first variable is uh, politics. In the Latin American region, countries have been consolidating their democracies. They've been adopting uh, models and uh, uh, political models of transparency, of openness, and today, today. Well, the problems that we were seeing in the past are not being seen anymore right now, especially in this region. And perhaps uh, with some very particular elements here, but uh, these are democracies that are now being consolidated. This is, of course, case in point. Mexico would be a case in point now. The consistent uh, problem that we still have in this region, which is a big challenge, of course, is poverty and inequality. And on the other hand, according to ACLAC uh, data, uh, poverty and extreme poverty have uh, fallen in recent years. And here I have some figures that I wanted to share with you only on this item of 2012-2014. In the region, poverty went down from 44 to 28 percent, extreme poverty from 19 to 11 percent. So the Latin American region has also had um, growth, uh, a constant uh, sustained growth, uh, higher than the rest of the world. Let me share with you some data on this. Uh, and uh, average growth 2010, 2014, 3.7% vis-a-vis growth. Uh, that has a marked contrast with the European Union is just 1% growth. Uh, countries like Japan, 1.5%. And even the United States, 2.1% uh, growth. Now, these are just uh, uh, some of the figures and data as well of the Latin American region, which uh, uh, make Latin America such a different region right now, a region which is growing, of course, and a region which is now facing different challenges. The challenges of our times, of course, challenges we're going to be talking about here today. And countries with more consolidated democracies that have allowed for precisely this constant and especially this very particular feature and characteristic of it being a region of less uh, uh, problems, less crisis, and more development, and more progress being made in terms of the challenges we face uh, regarding poverty and equality in Latin America. Mr. President, could you tell us about Mexico? Talk to us about Mexico, especially help us understand the good and the Mexican, uh, the good and the bad Mexico, the Mexico with a great potential, the size, the dynamism, the people in Mexico, and they connected to the U.S. economy, of course. Uh, 
uh, different free trade agreements, members of OECD, and many important steps you have taken. The reforms, for instance, you have undertaken. But this is a contrast with the bad Mexico in the newspapers, the cartels, the murder in Mexico, the Chapo, and the drug uh, situation in Mexico. Could you help us understand the coexistence of those two Mexicans? Well, let me tell you something, Moises. I think there's only a good Mexico, a good Mexico. But however, we are a country that is not, not exempt, like any other country in the world, of course, exempt from having problems, from having uh, our own uh, challenges in uh, uh, the subject matters and the topics you have presented, you have discussed the insecurity, especially in some parts of our territory. And we also have problems. Uh, we are a platform for drug trafficking to arrive in the most important consuming market, which is uh, North America. And we do have our own problems, of course. I insist, like any other country has its own problems. However, we are a good country. We are a country that is, is really differentiated in the region. It is really distinguishing itself because of everything that has been able to accomplish in recent years. The Mexico of today, the Mexico of today is a very different Mexico of the Mexico we had some 30 years ago, for instance, a very a, a, a much known because of the recurrent economic crisis in the past and also the economic problems that unfortunately have made us uh, have so many setbacks backs in social development, for instance, nonetheless, Today, I think that we have overcome all these very adverse scenarios. Now, something that's really noteworthy here, uh, we have great institutional stability for 80 years in Mexico, for instance. We've had political stability. And since then, we've also had every six years a renewal in the executive branch. And this has been done within a climate of political stability. And we've also consolidated our democracy, and we've given uh, room and space and margins so the different voices and the different ideologies, as well as the different ways of thinking among Mexicans may be politically expressed throughout the country, and we've stopped living under a regime with hegemony of a single political party, and we're now open, authentically very open, to a full democracy, a democracy that is increasingly consolidating every day in Mexico. Within this uh, scenario, uh, with democracy, we've been able to reach a great political agreement. And this is something that I would really like to highlight here. This was accomplished three years ago when I started my administration, December 2012. 2012 yes. And in this case, uh, together with the participation of the different political forces of my country, we're able to establish an agenda of changes, an agenda of transformations. And this this had been, had been postponed for many years. The topics that I remember that were being discussed in the electoral political campaign of 2012, that where I participated, where I became the president of Mexico, well, these are topics that were unthinkable in the past. We never thought they would materialize. These were reforms and structural changes that today are a reality. And this undoubtedly, of course, gives us a condition of greater strength vis-a-vis -vis this scenario in uh, the world. Uh, of the world of high volatility, uncertainty, and also risk aversion. And uh, in the face of this scenario, Mexico is better prepared. And the reforms are not in theory. Uh, reforms are not just saying the benefits eventually. Undoubtedly, there are going to be benefits, even more benefits, as the implementation of reforms uh, mature. But right now, we are uh, seeing very important benefits. Let me just just uh, uh tell you uh, about some of the variables that are showing this condition that I'm talking about. Last year, for instance, in Mexico, we broke record of uh, the number of jobs generated. Over 1.8 million jobs created in Mexico. This is the highest figure of jobs generated in Mexico. The unemployment rate, which is low in Mexico, if we compare it to other countries, of less than 5%. So, and uh, we were able to have the lowest inflation rate uh, 
ever in the history of Mexico since inflation is being measured, and this is 45 years now, 2.13 percent. And uh, these are therefore indicators that are showing the strength of our country. And uh, domestic consumption, domestic market uh, is also moving. And if we add the fact that uh, we are a country with a privileged uh, geographic condition and position we're part of uh, Latin America and also of North America. We are the bridge uh, between these two regions of the world. Uh, we are proud to say that we're Latin Americans, but we also have uh, uh, undoubted uh, integration with North America. Our main trade ally is the United States, of course. We have trade with North America of over $520 billion. And on the other hand, this is growing. The uh, reforms we've implemented, we have them political uh, in, in the uh, political arena and also in what society is going through right now. And we also have reforms at the economic level. And let me also say something about at least three reforms that are undoubtedly give us this uh, armored uh, characteristic in the face of the world situation. We have energy reform, for instance, that is breaking away from the mo model Mexico had in the last 50 years. And and we are opening the energy sector, the exploitation of our um, underground resources, hydrocarbons, for instance, and the energy sector, the electric energy sector. We are promoting competition, so this will benefit users. Users will be benefited. Society at large will benefit. So all these inputs may be acquired under better conditions at lower prices. And the same for the families, as for businesses and the industry. And the telecommunications reform opens this sector to greater competition so that we may supply telephony, mobile, fixed telephony services, internet services to increase our situation of competitiveness, especially through the, all this means. And the financial reform as well. This financial reform is the scaffolding process, and it is really highlighting a need we had. Although we did have a financial system as the one that we have, which is a robust system, undoubtedly the credit level we had in our country was still uh, well below uh, the level of other economies. And today, the credit level in Mexico is growing. Uh, we went from having a credit level of about 25% vis-a-vis the GDP. Now it is about 32% vis-a-vis the G GDP. And the credit level is also growing at higher rates than the economy. I'm talking about 3.5%. Well, in this consistency, we are going to be very close at the end of my administration, 2018, very close to reaching the goal we have set out to accomplish to reach credit levels of about 40%. This is what is happening now in Mexico. This is the armoring process we have in Mexico, the structural reforms that give us uh, more solidity and soundness and better preparation to face challenges. And uh, so that we can, of course, face this uh, very uh, convulsed uh, scenario in the world. Yes, President, you know that uh, uh, people were really supporting you. People were welcoming all your reforms. But at the same time, there's concern on the sustainability of those reforms you've launched. The energy reform is a case in point, Mr. President. With the fall of oil prices, for instance, people are wondering if that is going to be undermining the viability of your energy reforms, Mr. President. Well, this dialogue gives me the opportunity to give you more precise information on the path, uh, the route, the path that we have set out to accomplish from here till the end of my administration, 2018. First of all, preserving our strength and our uh, macroeconomic fundamentals. This is our main priority, maintaining this condition. Second, implementing the due and efficient implementation of the structural reforms. Among them, let me mention the energy reform. And we have set out, and we are very clear on this, beyond the juncture of this scenario of the fall in oil prices, throughout the world, we are resolved and determined to implement in a timely manner the energy reform. 
This has been very successful. We've had different rounds. Round one, the different bidding processes that have taken place have been quite successful. Let me just tell you that in December, uh, the 25 fields that were included in the bidding process, they were fully placed. With the offering of the participating companies, the national and uh, the foreign companies as well, over and beyond the expectations we had. Now, we have the following bid of round one, which would be the one that has to do with deep waters. And I believe that towards the second semester of this year, we are opening the information data. The data room is now open for those companies that will eventually be participating in the bidding process. But I insist, beyond this juncture, well, I can assure you that we're determined to implement the reform and to accomplish the due implementation of this reform. Obviously, it will be the responsibility of the regulating institute, the, the regulating commission that will be deciding uh, the aspects on the bidding of these fields because it has to be under conditions of advantage and benefits for Mexico. But the fact we now have low oil prices right now uh, does not prevent us, does not limit, does not stop uh, the implementation of the energy reform in Mexico. And the corresponding stage that we be, should be implementing. Another threat for the reforms is, of course, all the winds that are against the, uh, all the countries from the world economy, of course. It's easier to reform so you have an economic boom than when you're having economic problems. But the emerging countries are now facing very turbulent waters, President. And Mexico belongs to the emerging countries section. But you say that Mexico is better positioned than the other emerging countries to face up to these difficulties. Could you explain? Yes, well, look, I would like to reiterate what I have already said, Moises. I think the strength of Mexico is precisely, well, first of all, the fact that in a very timely, opportune fashion, we've made decisions precisely uh, preventive decisions uh, regarding government expenditure without really knowing which was going to be the horizon vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the uh, raw material prices, especially oil prices, with uh, also in a very timely position, 2015, we decided to take preventive measures to cut our expenditure, and we have kept this scenario. We we are maintaining it with a commitment of maintaining this exercise in a multi-annual fashion to increasingly reduce deficit in Mexico and thus be able to have less expenditure beyond any scenario that we might have at the international level with the purpose of maintaining our macroeconomic strength. And this fundamentally depends on, on having a responsible public finance management in our country, uh, highly respectful of the monetary management done by the central bank of our country. Now, on the other hand, another very important condition, another reason for our being better prepared is that we've done our structural reforms in a very timely manner. This give, uh, gives us this uh, solidity, and I think the elements I've given you in, in terms of employment, inflation, and also the domestic consumption we have and the performance of our economy, well, this all shows, and they bear testimony, a very faithful testimony, timely testimony on how this very adverse scenario that we have in the world, well, even under those circumstances, Mexico is moving forward, it's still growing. When we see, on the other hand, in other countries, there's economic slowdown, but in Mexico, we are growing. We're not reaching the desired levels, of course, but undoubtedly, the, our economic growth is a big contrast with the growth of other parts of the world, particularly uh, the Latin American region. And of course, this also constitutes great strength through Mexico, I'm talking about our integration with North America. I insist our main trade partner is the United States. And we are now working to accomplish a, a greater uh, productivity in the North American region. And we are also in a very joint manner with the US administration. We're establishing mechanisms for better logistics for the trade exchange that we already have now. We've uh, implemented a pilot plan 
for the pre-clearance and customs of the United States and also of our country. This is a, uh, a project, a pilot program for three customs, two are already operating. So our trade will be more agile, more efficient, and this is part of the agreement that we have signed and that we have made with the United States. Of course, there we see great strength. And I think the free trade agreement that we've signed with the United States and Canada, now our participation as well in the TPP, which is already going in the stage of being signed and passed by Congresses, but it's 12 countries that are part of this great free trade agreement between America and the Asia-Pacific region. Undoubtedly, this gives us a horizon of great potential and greater strength in the face of uh, this uh, uh, such a rapidly moving sea that the world is going through. Yes, Mr. President, you've gone through a very complex stage with a lot of surprises and certain turbulences. Now, what do you know now that you didn't know when you took over the country? Well, I think being in the presidency has undoubtedly given me the opportunity to see and feel in a more direct fashion the great strength of Mexico and the great potential of Mexico. And I can now know better the different regions of the country. And I can also see, on the other hand, this great renewed spirit in the Mexican youth. Let me also tell tell you that uh, more than half of the population, practically half of the Mexican population, mainly very young people, youth, uh, uh, 27 years of age uh, as an average. And now we're seeing in entrepreneurship of our young people in their capacity, their creative capacity, they're all wanting to participate in productive activities. We can see how they are becoming part of this. That's why the government has already designed mechanisms to fund, to finance different projects for youth without any credit history, so they may be able to participate in productive programs. And we're also promoting through what we see in Mexico, we have created the National Entrepreneurs Institute. We're creating the environment to encourage young people to participate and to be able to develop their own projects. And they're being very successful right now. And we are supporting, accompanying this with voices and benchmarks and references, a very successful a businessmen in Mexico that have decided to participate in all these efforts. It is clear that today uh, governing, as we can see it throughout the world, is, is not an easy tax, the, uh, task. This is quite a complex task. We are seeing political scenarios with great convulsions. And uh, however, I do see it everything with great optimism. I see it with optimism because Mexico has shown, and it is also showing itself as a country, that as of this strengths of these conditions, uh, well, uh, that democracy where you can put uh, and include the different uh, expressions and visions on the development of Mexico, and you see political plurality in our country, it is therefore possible to materialize agreements. It is possible to reach agreements on what the country needs. For those that are supposing, assuming that democracy and our democratic consultation validation is an obstacle for the country to have a scenario of greater development. I believe that this recent years, especially the, what we have shown and what we have shown ourselves and what we have shown the world is that we can transform ourselves. We can transform ourselves positively. And this is the path we're on. This is exactly what we're doing. I'm truly a very optimistic person in uh, seeing how Mexico is transforming forming itself, and I see a highly promising horizon for a country in the years to come, especially as of everything we've built among all uh, the Mexican citizens. This is the importance I see. This is the way I see it. I insist I'm not alien from the difficulties today in terms of ruling, governing in a democratic system. And uh, this is our condition. This is our very particular situation. This is a strength, and i rather see it as a great opportunity to continue growing in our country. You belong to a generation of heads of state, heads of state, uh, ruling with an activated society, a society that is awake, very much awake, and it has, it, it knows it has more rights and more individual instruments. 
that it may use uh, social networks, for instance, and uh, the middle class in Mexico it is growing in your country. This is a uh, more connected, uh, educated, and well-trained middle class with new demands on the state and the government. One of those demands, Mr. President, is, of course, a renewed uh, uh, tolerance against corruption. Corruption in Mexico, as you know, this is an everyday issue, topic, and this is part of the national and international discussion. People are going out on the streets in Mexico, Guatemala, and Brazil, Chile, and many other countries where there is a new intolerance against uh, corruption. Now, this hasn't been a surprise to you how corruption has become a, a topic of social activism that it was never present in Mexico before. Well, I think, first of all, that for those of us that have been working in Mexico, well, in terms of the reforms, changes, and political policies we're promoting in my country, and the different infrastructure plans we're also promoting and developing, I believe there's a purpose for all this. The purpose is to for us to generate in Mexico a bigger middle class, and for us to continue generating in Mexico society with better conditions, with better revenues, better income, and more opportunities. And of course, today, there is a society which is fortunately very active with great participation. I believe the challenge is in our uh, being able every day to have greater empathy uh, between the acting uh, uh, government, which is a performing government, and demanding society. How do we find these points of encounter and communication and dialogue? And also, how can we really make effective, or pay attention rather, effective attention to many of the demands in our society? And the very particular issue you're mentioning on corruption, I have have dared uh, say that uh, from Mexico, not only from Mexico, really, I think this is not only uh, 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 an issue for Mexico, I think this is taking place in many societies and practically of all the latitudes. I think this was a problem more of a cultural order. And however, today I can tell you that uh, I would dare say that this is even that was when, uh, when we were talking about the structural changes we are implementing especially to fight corruption in Mexico. And for that purpose, we created a national anti-corruption system, which is now being consolidated. We still need secondary legislation for it. But it has, is clearly defined in our constitution, as well as a national transparency system, which is also going through the stage of implementation in the country. These are two very important mechanisms of high relevance to fight corruption in Mexico. I think, therefore, that today what we're doing, and this is something that I've said, is uh, we're trying to control and uh, the human condition. This is what we're trying to control. We're trying to, uh, this is the taming uh, process. And I've said this before. This is a cultural. Perhaps I've said it once. But I think it is rather more of a topic related to human condition. And today, in the face of this demand made by society, with the, and rightly so, I believe that it's a matter of establishing more controls uh, the way we're doing in Mexico, we're doing this in Mexico, taming, taming this uh, uh, human weakness that it has to be uh, set uh, within the process of uh, an orderly process. And this is what we have opted in Mexico, among other important instruments. This is uh, having open governments that are increasingly transparent governments and their, their performance, their actions, uh, what they spend uh, the money on, how they're spending and how much they spend, and accountability, of course. And an anti-corruption national system which sets forth greater controls, not only for the federal branch, Branch, because in Mexico, we have three different government levels, uh, the federal, the state, and the municipal, so that this audit, this inspection uh, models are not just taking place at the federal level. We do have different control mechanisms there. But for this to be permeating, especially where we find greater levels of corruption, which is right at the base of the pyramid, and so that we can make sure that there's a system that will be uh, enforced at three levels of government. I'm running out of time, Mr. President, we had promised you're going to tell us, are you going to be extraditing Chapo? Well, 
On this question, let me first of all tell you that I have uh, made great recognition and acknowledgement of the public security institutions in my country because really what happened was that they were able to re and Chapel Guzman. And for us, this was undoubtedly a difficult moment of stress, of tension when he fled, when he escaped from the uh, prison. Uh, for the reasons and according to the investigation that's taking place on his escape from jail in terms of the law enforcement agencies, we would have to still make those conclusions. But the important thing is that we reapprehended him. He was one of the most important criminals in the world. He was being sought for throughout the world. And this has been done through the public security areas in our country. It is very clear today. And this is something that I've also said publicly. Uh, the, uh, the Attorney General's Office in Mexico, which is uh, the uh, instance responsible for all this, it is now working uh, to continue the process, the due process, uh, according to the crimes that he's being accused for. It, we are working um, for extradition. Yes, we are working on this. Of course, this has to, to go through a process with the judicial branch of Mexico participating as well. But the the indication of the Attorney General's Office right now is to be working and to speed up its work so that as soon as possible we can extradite this criminal, which is uh, highly dangerous. I have been asked to let you know that uh, after the session we're going to have Professor Klaus Schwab and Bono uh, here uh, commemorating, celebrating an anniversary of the Red Campaign. So I was asked to ask you to please stay seated uh, when we uh, finish the session. Let us conclude this session, President. Let me thank you so much for such an interesting conversation. Thank you. I am also very grateful. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Good afternoon.